Middlemarch by George Eliot. Chapter seventy seven. And thus thy fall hath left a kind of blot to mark the full fraught man and best endued with some suspicion. Henry V. The next day Lydgate had to go to Brassing, and told Rosamond that he should be away until the evening. Of late she had never gone beyond her own house and garden, except to church, and once to see her papa, to whom she said, "'If Tertius goes away, you will help us to move, will you not, papa? I suppose we shall have very little money. I am sure I hope some one will help us.' And Mr. Vincey had said, "'Yes, child, I don't mind a hundred or two. I can see the end of that.' With these exceptions she had sat at home in languid melancholy and suspense, fixing her mind on Will Ladislaw's coming as the one point of hope and interest, and associating this with some new urgency on Lydgate's to make immediate arrangements for leaving Middlemarch and going to London, till she felt assured that the coming would be a potent cause of the going, without at all seeing how. This way of establishing sequence is too common to be fairly regarded as a peculiar folly in Rosamond, and it is precisely this sort of sequence which causes the greatest shock when it is sundered, for to see how an effect may be produced is often to see possible missings and checks, but to see nothing except the desirable cause, and close upon it the desirable effect, rids us of doubt, and makes our minds strongly intuitive. That was the process going on in poor Rosamond while she arranged all objects around her with the same nicety as ever, only with more slowness, or sat down to the piano meaning to play, and then desisting, yet lingering on the music-stool with her white fingers suspended on the wooden front, and looking before her in dreamy ennui. Her melancholy had become so marked that Lydgate felt a strange timidity before it, as a perpetual silent reproach and the strong man, mastered by his keen sensibilities towards this fair, fragile creature, whose life he seemed somehow to have bruised, shrank from her look, and sometimes started at her approach. Fear of her, and fear for her rushing in only the more forcibly after it, had been momentarily expelled by exasperation. But this morning Rosamond descended from her room upstairs, where she sometimes sat the whole day while Lydgate was out, equipped for a walk in the town. She had a letter to post— a letter addressed to Mr. Ladislaw, and written with charming discretion, but intended to hasten his arrival by a hint of trouble. The servant-maid, their sole house-servant now, noticed her coming downstairs in her walking-dress, and thought, "'There never did anybody look so pretty in a bonnet, poor thing!' Meanwhile Dorothea's mind was filled with her project of going to Rosamond, and with the many thoughts, both of the past and the probable future, which gathered around the idea of that visit." Until yesterday, when Lydgate had opened to her a glimpse of some trouble in his married life, the image of Mrs. Lydgate had always been associated for her with that of Will Ladislaw. Even in her most uneasy moments, even when she had been agitated by Mrs. Cadwallader's painfully graphic report of gossip, her effort, nay, her strongest impulsive prompting, had been towards the vindication of Will from any sullying surmises— and when, in her meeting with him afterwards, she had at first interpreted his words as a probable allusion to a feeling towards Mrs. Lydgate, which he was determined to cut himself off from indulging, she had a quick, sad, excusing vision of the charm there might be in his constant opportunities of companionship with that fair creature, who most likely shared his other tastes, as she evidently did his delight in music. But there had followed his parting words— the few passionate words in which he had implied that she herself was the object of whom his love held him in dread, that it was his love for her only which he was resolved not to declare, but to carry away into banishment. From the time of that parting, Dorothea, believing in Will's love for her, believing with a proud delight in his delicate sense of honour, and his determination that no one should impeach him justly, felt her heart quite at rest as to the regard he might have for Mrs. Lydgate. She was sure that the regard was blameless." There are natures in which, if they love us, we are conscious of having a sort of baptism and consecration. They bind us over to rectitude and purity by their pure belief about us, and our sins become that worst kind of sacrilege which tears down the invisible altar of trust. If you are not good, none is good. Those little words may give a terrific meaning to responsibility, may hold a vitriolic intensity for remorse. Dorothea's nature was of that kind. Her own passionate faults lay along the easily counted open channels of her ardent character, 
and while she was full of pity for the visible mistakes of others, she had not yet any material within her experience for subtle constructions and suspicions of hidden wrong. But that simplicity of hers, holding up an ideal for others in her believing conception of them, was one of the great powers of her womanhood, and it had from the first acted strongly on Will Ladislaw. He felt, when he parted from her, that the brief words by which he had tried to convey to her his feeling about herself, and the division which her fortune made between them, would only profit by their brevity when Dorothea had to interpret them. He felt that in her mind he had found his highest estimate. And he was right there. In the months since their parting Dorothea had felt a delicious, though sad, repose in their relation to each other, as one which was inwardly whole and without blemish. She had an active force of antagonism within her, when the antagonism turned on the defence either of plans or persons that she believed in, and the wrongs which she felt that Will had received from her husband, and the external conditions which to others were grounds for slighting him, only gave the more tenacity to her affection and admiring judgment. And now, with the disclosures about Bulstrode, had come another fact affecting Will's social position, which roused afresh Dorothea's inward resistance to what was said about him in that part of her world, which lay within Park Pollings. Young Ladislaw, the grandson of a thieving Jew pawnbroker, was a phrase which had entered emphatically into the dialogues about the Bulstrode business at Lowick, Tipton, and Freshet, and was a worse kind of placard on poor Will's back than the Italian with white mice. Upright Sir James Chatham was convinced that his own satisfaction was righteous when he thought, with some complacency, that here was an added league to that mountainous distance between Ladislaw and Dorothea, which enabled him to dismiss any anxiety in that direction as too absurd. And perhaps there had been some pleasure in pointing Mr. Brooke's attention to this ugly bit of Ladislaw's genealogy, as a fresh candle for him to see his own folly by. Dorothea had observed the animus with which Will's part in the painful story had been recalled more than once, but she had uttered no word, being checked now, as she had not been formerly in speaking of Will, by the consciousness of a deeper relation between them, which must always remain in consecrated secrecy. But her silence shrouded her resistant emotion into a more thorough glow. And this misfortune in Will's lot, which, it seemed, others were wishing to fling at his back as an opprobrium, only gave something more of enthusiasm to her clinging thought. She entertained no visions of their ever coming into nearer union, and yet she had taken no posture of renunciation. She had accepted her whole relation to Will very simply, as part of her marriage sorrows, and would have thought it very sinful in her to keep up an inward wail, because she was not completely happy— being rather disposed to dwell on the superfluities of her lot. She could bear that the chief pleasures of her tenderness should lie in memory, and the idea of marriage came to her solely as a repulsive proposition from some suitor of whom she at present knew nothing, but whose merits, as seen by her friends, would be a source of torment to her. "'Somebody who will manage your property for you, my dear,' was Mr. Brooke's attractive suggestion of suitable characteristics. "'I should like to manage it myself if I knew what to do with it,' said Dorothea. No, she had heard to her declaration that she would never be married again, and in the long valley of her life, which looked so flat and empty of waymarks, guidance would come as she walked along the road, and saw her fellow passengers by the way. This habitual state of feeling about Will Ladislaw had been strong in all her waking hours since she had proposed to pay a visit to Mrs. Lydgate, making a sort of background against which she saw Rosamond's figure presented to her without hindrances to her interest and compassion. There was evidently some mental separation, some barrier to complete confidence which had arisen between this wife and the husband, who had yet made her happiness a law to him. That was a trouble which no third person must directly touch. But Dorothea thought with deep pity of the loneliness which must have come upon Rosamond from the suspicions cast on her husband, and there would surely be help in the manifestation of respect for Lydgate and sympathy with her. "'I shall talk to her about her husband.' thought Dorothea, as she was being driven towards the town. The clear spring morning, the scent of the moist earth, the fresh leaves just showing their creased-up wealth of greenery from out their half-open sheaths, seemed part of the cheerfulness she was feeling from a long conversation with Mr. Fairbrother, who had joyfully accepted the justifying explanation of Lydgate's conduct. "'I shall take Mrs. Lydgate good news, and perhaps she will like to talk to me and make a friend of me.' Dorothea had another errand in Lowick Gate— it was about a new, fine-toned bell for the schoolhouse, 
and as she had to get out of her carriage very near to Lydgate's, she walked thither across the street, having told the coachman to wait for some packages. The street door was open, and the servant was taking the opportunity of looking out at the carriage which was pausing within sight, when it became apparent to her that the lady who belonged to it was coming towards her. "'Is Mrs. Lydgate at home?' said Dorothea. "'I'm not sure, my lady. I'll see, if you'll please to walk in,' said Martha, a little confused on the score of her kitchen apron, but collected enough to be sure that Mum was not the right title for this queenly young widow with a carriage and pair. "'Will you please to walk in, and I'll go and see?' "'Say that I am Mrs. Casabon, said Dorothea, as Martha moved forward, intending to show her into the drawing-room, and then to go upstairs to see if Rosamond had returned from her walk. They crossed the broader part of the entrance-hall, and turned up the passage which led to the garden. The drawing-room door was unlatched, and Martha, pushing it without looking into the room, waited for Mrs. Casabon to enter, and then turned away, the door having swung open and swung back again without noise. Dorothea had less of outward vision than usual this morning, being filled with images of things as they had been and were going to be. She found herself on the other side of the door without seeing anything remarkable, but immediately she heard a voice, speaking in low tones, which startled her as with a sense of dreaming in daylight, and advancing unconsciously a step or two beyond the projecting slab of a bookcase, she saw, in the terrible illumination of a certainty which filled up all outlines, something which made her pause, motionless, without self-possession enough to speak. Seated with his back toward her on a sofa, which stood against the wall on a line with the door, by which she had entered, she saw Will Ladislaw close by him and turned towards him with a flushed tearfulness which gave a new brilliancy to her face sat rosamond her bonnet hanging back while will leaning towards her clasped both her upraised hands in his and spoke with low-toned fervour rosamond in her agitated absorption had not noticed the silently advancing figure but when dorothea after the first immeasurable instant of this vision moved confusedly backward and found herself impeded by some piece of furniture Rosamond was suddenly aware of her presence, and with a spasmodic movement snatched away her hands and rose, looking at Dorothea, who was unnecessarily arrested. Will Ladislaw, starting up, looked round also, and meeting Dorothea's eyes with a new lightning in them, seemed changing to marble. But she immediately turned them away from him to Rosamond, and said in a firm voice, "'Excuse me, Mrs. Lydgate. The servant did not know that you were here. I called to deliver an important letter for Mr. Lydgate, which I wish to put into your own hands.' She laid down the letter on the small table which had checked her retreat, and then, including Rosamond and Will, in one distant glance and bow, she went quickly out of the room, meeting in the passage the surprised Martha, who said she was sorry the mistress was not at home, and then showed the strange lady out, with an inward reflection that grand people were probably more impatient than others. Dorothea walked across the street with her most elastic step, and was quickly in her carriage again. "'Drive on to Freshet Hall,' she said to the coachman, and any one looking at her— might have thought that though she was paler than usual she was never animated by a more self-possessed energy and that was really her experience it was as if she had drunk a great draught of scorn that stimulated her beyond the susceptibility to other feelings she had seen something so far below her belief that her emotions rushed back from it and made an excited throng without an object she needed something active to turn her excitement out upon she felt power to walk and work for a day without meat or drink and she would carry out the purpose with which she had started in the morning, of going to Freshet and Tipton, to tell Sir James and her uncle all that she wished them to know about Lydgate, whose married loneliness under his trial now presented itself to her with new significance, and made her more ardent in readiness to be his champion. She had never felt anything like this triumphant power of indignation in the struggle of her married life, in which there had always been a quickly subduing pang, and she took it as a sign of new strength, "'Dodo, how very bright your eyes are!' said Celia, when Sir James was gone out of the room. "'When you don't see anything you look at, Arthur, or anything, you are going to do something uncomfortable, I know. Is it all about Mr. Lydgate, or has something else happened?' Celia had been used to watch her sister with expectation. "'Yes, dear, a great many things have happened,' said Dodo, in her full tones. "'I wonder what?' said Celia, folding her arms cosily and leaning forward upon them. "'Oh, all the troubles of all the people on the face of the earth,' said Dorothea, lifting her arms to the back of her head. "'Dear me, Dodo, are you going to have a scheme for them?' said Celia, a little uneasily at this Hamlet-like raving. But Sir James came in again, ready to accompany Dorothea to the Grange, and she finished her expedition well. 
not swerving in her resolution until she descended at her own door. End of chapter 77 Read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk www.rlowalrus.sitesled.com